Ya. Ya. Exactly. <laughs> Are we on? All right. Well, welcome back. So last week, the last thing I ended with was a talk about uh, Baal and Ashtoreth, right? Did that make sense? And it maybe answers some questions? Okay. And it's, you know, so much of that being from myth mythology, we have to just kind of take it with a grain of salt. But when you go back and research who Baal was, who Asterisk was, and the whole story is it takes you back to Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, it starts making sense because if, if that's what had happened, and then when God came down and divided the lands and split the lands apart, then that's how all the different cultures ended up with pretty much the same story and the same characters. And this is what plagued Israel during this entire, what, six or eight hundred years in the Promised Land. They would always go back to the same sins. In our chart that you have this one, I think it's on page, I don't know what page it's on. <laughs> chart 45, page 188-189. On this, we see that we had Saul, David, and then Solomon. And at this time, there wasn't really any mention of Baal worship. But after but after that, when the kingdoms divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, was when everything started going bad. Remember, we started with uh, Jehokim and um, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, when they split apart, Rehoboam being Solomon's son and Jeroboam being the other leader who took the ten northern tribes. So once that happened, that was when all of this worship of other gods started, and primary of Baal and Ashtoreth, and that came back to Nimrod and Samaramis, just under a different disguise and different names. In the second chart here, all the way out to 722, when the northern tribes went into captivity in Assyria, and 586 over here, where the southern tribes went into captivity, cap <laughs> whoa, captivity, what we see here is all underneath here are these prophets. Well, if you look back after in Saul, David, and Solomon, there were no prophets. There was no need. The prophets were sent in to warn them. But then after that, right after this northern and southern kingdom split, then you see that we have the names of these prophets start showing up. Um, see, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, you started seeing some of the ones for the southern tribes here, Obadiah, Joel, and then further in time, we saw up to Hosea. Here we had Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Jeremiah. So it wasn't until the kingdom separated we started having trouble, and that was when they started worshiping these foreign gods, which I kind of talked about last week, who that was and where that came from. And then now we get in the time of all these prophets. And these prophets were warning them against what they're doing, trying to turn them back to God. Say, if you don't return back to God, you're going to go into captivity. You know, God's going to take, take you out of your land and take your gift away from you. What does that all go back to? Remember in... Deuteronomy, remember the book of Deuteronomy was like a legal contract. Remember I showed you it was, it was like the boilerplate for all contracts, almost like between like a landlord and a tenant. And this was all related to that. God, God had made a covenant with them, but there were stipulations, you know, not to have any foreign gods. 
and worship other gods. And they were getting away from the, from the contract. You know, Deuteronomy is what set this all up. And so all of this time, all of these, all of these different prophets that were coming into play were because they were breaking the contract. And they were warning them. They're coming in and say, hey, you can't play your music that loud. Hey, you've got to pay your rent on time. Hey, you can't have wild parties or you're going to get kicked out of your apartment. This is, in effect, what was going on. So all of this that was taking place was because they were starting to break this contract. And in... Oops. This mic's giving me a lot of trouble. In that contract, the stipulation was that if, if you stay away from me, then I will kick you, you, you know, then we're going to be almost like a separation between, between us, and that is what happened. So these prophets we're going to talk about, the five major prophets in the beginning, and then the 12 minor prophets at the end of the Bible, they all come back into this timeline, into this time period of roughly four, 500 years, 400 years, they come back in here, and they're coming in here and telling us, hey, you need to turn away from false idols, turn back to God. You know, go back to serving God. Go back to the, you know, go back to the Torah, you know, the law that was given by Moses. So when we think of these, these were all of these guys that were, all these things that were happening in this time frame in here. And notice the northern tribes were... why this is fighting me so bad. The northern tribes, if you look at them, almost every one of the kings was bad. Remember this chart showed them as shaded? I mean, I don't think there was one good one. In the southern tribes, they were about half good and half bad when we look at all these. The, shade, the clear ones being good ones that did, that did God's will and the ones that turned away from God. So the first one we're going to talk about is Isaiah. And Isaiah is, notice he's right here at the time of Hezekiah. Kind of the end of Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. So he prophesied in that time. These prophets were coming in and saying, hey, you need to turn away from Baal worship, from Asherah worship, and turn back to God, or God's going to take the land away from you. They were doing this hundreds of years before it happened. So it wasn't like they didn't have advanced warning. You know, when we got to the point that they went into captivity, they couldn't say, well, no one ever told us. You know, God, you didn't tell us what happened. He said, well, I've been telling you for 400 years. So when we think of this, it was a long time. God was very, very patient with these people. You know, how many of you have patience that would last 400 years if you had a, someone renting an apartment they were not paying bills, you know, having wild parties. I mean, usually trying to get them kicked out within a month or so. So God was being incredibly patient. So this next section is going to be the five major, or the five major prophets. They have major prophets and minor. It has nothing to do with their, how good they were, but only has to do with how much they wrote. So to start this, um, let me start out with prayer. Heavenly Father, I just ask your uh, blessing on this message tonight. And Father, whatever is going on with this microphone, Lord, I just lay it at your feet before I lay it at my feet and stomp on it. But thank you for everybody that's here and bless those that aren't here. And just uh, the things I say tonight, Lord, just let them make sense and uh, to be your words and uh, coming from the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And bless those that are here to receive these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. See if the microphone behaves. Oh, was it? Yeah. <laughs> well, if I went to the wake of VBS, I'd need to be laid at God's feet too. So. Okay. So Old Testament prophets were addressed by, were addressing the generations of God's people who lived between 840 and 420 BC. So that's 420 years. The the prophets warned repeatedly that if the northern tribes and southern tribes of Judah didn't repent and turn back to God, they would just be destroyed, but they didn't listen. They might for a little while, but they always went right back. 
Looking back, we recall that the history of God's people being categorized into four periods. Remember we talked about this? It was camp, commonwealth, crown, and captivity. This thing is trying to kill me. Okay. So he had camp. Commonwealth, crown, and captivity. Camp referred to the time when they were camped out, right? Forty years in the desert, sleeping in tents. Abraham. You know, Abraham was always in a tent. So nobody was a permanent resident. Does that make sense? I mean, are we permanent residents? Hope not. Next one was commonwealth. The commonwealth was the time, remember, when they went into the uh, promised land, and you had the time of Judges, the time of uh, uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel. And then crown was when they wanted a king. Remember the people decided they wanted a king, and God told them what they would get when they got a king, but they wanted him anyway, and so they elected, chose Saul to be their king. Okay, so crown ultimately led them into captivity. Northern tribes went to Assyria. Southern tribes went to Babylon into captivity. The times that the prophets were in play was during this time of crown and captivity. It wasn't until they decided they wanted a king over them that they started having trouble with foreign gods. What was their hierarchy as far as government before the time of crown? They had a high priest who answered directly to God, and so God was the head, high priest was their mediator, and then they were the people. They didn't need prophets. In the millennial kingdom, we will have our high priest, Jesus, as our mediator between us and God. We will be returning to that like commonwealth type, type government. Hopefully, we won't need prophets then either. So... Prophet's audience were the people listening in these last two periods. Prophecy comes from the Hebrew root um, niba, which means to summon or announce or call. So a prophet is one who is appointed to proclaim as a herald the message of God. Glacier Arson, or Gleason uh, Archer, interprets this as one called by God to proclaim as a herald from the court of heaven the message to be transmitted from God to man. So a prophet is someone called by God who is to be his spokesman to tell his words to the people. A prophet wasn't to interpret God's words and give his rendition of it, but to actually give exactly what the, you know, God had said to him. There are a couple other titles called, that prophets were called by. Man of God was the first one. And so a lot of times you'll see it, in the Old Testament, is the man of God, man of God. And this suggests an intimate spiritual relationship with them. Another one is a seer. And when we heard, hear the term seer, we think of something, you know, like a, a, a median or something. Yeah, but it's actually the, in, in our Bibles when we hear seer, this is also a prophet. Where's an example of that? Remember King David? When you read about King David, he had a seer. Does anybody remember his name? Gad? Yeah, so sometimes, you know, David had a seer named Gad. But this is just a prophet, someone who God had chosen to be the one to be his, his voice on earth. Next one is servant. So to qualify as a prophet, one had to be called by the sovereign call of God. So just because you put your name prophet in front of your name, put the word prophet in front of your name, does not make someone a prophet. Do we see that today? Quite often, yeah. Especially if you get into, like, televangelists or YouTube videos. I mean, everybody's a prophet, and they usually have the name Isaiah somehow into their name. But to be called by sovereign call of God, have a special ability given by the Spirit of God, enabling the prophet to perceive the truth and equip him with the gift of communication communicating the revelation of God to people. Next one is have spiritual qualities such as 
unselfishness, obedience to God's love, faith, courage, and long-suffering. So primary ministry of a prophet was to deliver a message from God to an unbelieving and apostate Israel, both Israel and Jews in north and south. The term written or literary prophets were those chosen of God no only to publicly speak, but also be the authors of inspired canonical books or prophecies. Then we had oral prophets, and oral prophets were those who did not author books, like Jehu, Elisha, Elisha, Oded, and the rest there. Most of these ministered before the appearance of the written prophets. On your chart on page 45, in chart 45 and 46, on this chart, the way you can distinguish that is if one of the prophets has a line all the way around his name, he was an oral prophet. That means he, he was talked about and written about in the Bible, but he did not have his own book. So all of these are oral prophets. And then the written prophets have the dotted line around them, so you can distinguish that they were the ones that actually have their own book. So there should be 12 minors, right? No, the ones with dot around them, and then five major prophets. But actually, there are four. There's the one prophet, um, Jeremiah. He wrote Jeremiah and Lamentations. So there's actually four major prophets and then 12 minors. But on this chart here, that's kind of how you can distinguish whether it was a, a written or oral. Now this, you know, this is probably the best, the best chart in this book. I think this it kind of shows all the kingdoms and who is prophesying to them, whether it's northern tribe or southern tribe, and in what time period. Okay. Um, so I had 16 written prophets, four majors and 12 minors. The major prophets, both the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations, written by Jeremiah. On chart 78, on page 322 in your book, we have three different periods. And this all deals in the time of the prophets. They're divided, it's all divided by the exodus. We had um, pre, um, pre-exilic, uh, exilic, and then post-exilic. So depending on the exile. And this is the exile of 586 when the southern tribes went to, into captivity. So the the pre-exile prophets, they were the ones that were warning them that, hey, if you don't turn back to God, you're going to go into exile. You know, God's going to send in a nation to overthrow you and, and take you out as captives. During the exile, and how long was that time period for seven tribes? There was 70 years. During the exile, we had two prophets, Daniel and Ezekiel. So this would have been in... Persia, remember when Babylon took them captivity and then the Persian government took over? Remember like the whole story of um, Esther? Yeah. In Susa? Yeah, so during this time period we had Daniel and Ezekiel. Then after the exile, remember in um, when they returned to rebuild the city and the temple and the temple wall? During that time period there were, we had Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. So after the exile, when they returned, there were three prophets then, two prophets during the exile, and all the rest were before the exile. What, would, what were the ones doing after the exile? Yeah, remember they had, had the conflict with the surrounding nations that were coming against them as they built, rebuilt the wall and temple? So most of those prophets then were telling us to no, go ahead and rebuild, you know, rebuild it and support it for that. So when we think of our different time periods, we have the ones before the exile telling us, hey, you're going into exile, the ones during the exile, and the ones after. During the exile, they were, the, um, the prophets were usually telling them that you know, you're going to return, you'll go re- return and rebuild. Or they were actually given, pro- like Daniel, for example, he was given prophecies to King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Interpreting dreams. So there's those three different chart or time periods. The message of the prophets covers four areas. Instruction of the great truths about God and man. 
Remember, they were going after all these false gods, Baal and Asterisk mainly. So instructing the great truths about God and man, warning and appeal to those living in sin, comfort and exhortation to those trusting and obeying gods, and the predictions of events to come. So the prophets weren't always like all bad news. You know, most of it was bad news, bad news in the sense that, hey, you're doing wrong, you need to get back to God. But then they were also giving comfort to those who were doing good. So a lot of times the prophets would say, you know, comfort them and, and tell them, um, you know, exhortations for trusting and obeying God. Predictions of events to come. The prophets, and what's so interesting about when you read the prophets, they were looking at prophesying for what was about to come in their time, but then almost all of them had several meanings. So if a prophet was talking about like an exile to come or returning to rebuild the temple, there's a good chance if you look at it in depth, they were also looking at what was going to happen like Jesus' birth and the, the coming Messiah or even the millennial kingdom. So you can't, you know, a lot of people be real dogmatic and say, well, this prophecy also only meant this. It's like you, you need to be open-minded and say, well, it may have been this, this, and this. And chances are it applied to multiple things. And we see that a lot as time goes by, especially in the times we live today. So the things that they're looking at is the intimate settings, the politics and religious conditions of the time, and, its foreign, and the foreign powers at play. The powers that we had, remember we had, at the time of the first exile, Assyria was the major world power. Assyria was the northern tribe. Their kind of center of power was uh, Nineveh. Do you remember who Nineveh was founded by? Nimrod. Yeah, so the city of Nineveh had actually been founded by Nimrod. So when they went into captivity in the northern territories, Assyria, which is it's Mosul now, Mosul was the ancient Nimrod, or Nineveh, and that was where the northern tribes went into captivity. Remember, it was also where Jonah went on his little journey? The Assyrians took the northern tribes captive to Nineveh, 722, and then after Nineveh, then Babylon became the most powerful. Babylon was head, um, the Babylonians were headquartered in ancient Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was their ruler. This is the ruins of ancient Babylon here. So still relatively intact from excavations. Once they were in power, they took the southern tribes captive. So God used Nebuchadnezzar to take the southern tribes captive. Then after about 65, 68 years had passed, then Persians became the most dominant power. And Persians, remember that was led by King Cyrus? And they were, do I not have Susa? Yeah, there it is. So the Persian Empire was out of Susa, and they were, the Persian Empire was the ones that told them to return. Remember, Cyrus was the one that had the decree that said, the God of Israel has told me to return and rebuild build his temple. So they were out of Susa. So these were the three powers that were in play. So Assyria up to 612 B.C. and the fall of Nineveh, Babylonians up to 539, the fall of Babylon, and then Persia up to the time of Malachi and beyond. So the Persian Empire was in power till the end of all of these prophecies, till the end of our, our old, old Testament. Now, there are four prophetic points. The utterances of prophets, for the most part, were central around four points in history. On chart 79, this is kind of looking at mountain peaks, and they're doing it with the analogy of, well, if you're standing on top of a mountain, you can see a mountain peak, and then further beyond that, you can see another mountain peak, and further beyond that, you can see another mountain peak. You may not really be looking into the valleys, what happens between the two, and they kind of use that analogy here. 
So when a prophet was talking or prophesying, the first point was that he was talking about his own time. Yeah. Like, you need to repent or God's going to do this. And they was talking about, like, what is going to happen right now, what's going to happen today. The second thing that applied to is captivity and restoration. Remember, like, Isaiah was prophesying, you know, 100, 120 years before they went into captivity. So he was looking, you know, we're going to go into captivity at some time in the future. But what these also apply to is two other mountain peaks, Christ, the coming Messiah. So a lot of the prophecies they were doing could be applied to Christ. We see that a lot in Isaiah. And then also to the millennium in the new heavens and new earth. So if you're studying, you know, if you want to study eschatology, the study of the end times, you would think, well, we'll just go to Revelations. Well, actually, Matthew, Matthew 24 is like Jesus' rendition of it, but then you have to go back to all these Old Testament prophets because most of what they said, or a lot of what, what they were relating to, is what was going to happen at the end times. So if you think the Old Testament really doesn't apply anymore, it's like, no, it really applies now because we're getting closer and closer to the end. So when we read these prophets, keep in mind that they're kind of looking at one, two, three, or all four of these different time periods. Does anybody remember Isaiah 53? The suffering servant? Yeah, in Isaiah 53, he gives us an incredible description of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his death and crucifixion crucifixion, being pierced, I mean, just everything. I mean, he described crucifixion, you know, what, 800 years before it was even invented. And so even though he was relating something else, he was describing exactly what was going to happen in Jesus' time. This is a wonderful verse if you're uh, sharing and witnessing to Jewish people. And it's like, you know, they absolutely believe Isaiah. They don't believe in the New Testament or that Jesus was Messiah. And it's like, well, let's, let's go back and look at Isaiah 53. Oh, we're not allowed to read that. That was in your book, right? Well, yeah. Well, let's go read it. And it's really hard to deny that this is not the description of, of Jesus' life. So that's kind of an example of one. The Messianic themes. When a prophet speaks of Christ, he refers to him in either one of, one of his two comings. The first coming or his first advent as a suffering servant. The second com- coming, the second advent, is the reigning Messiah. So the prophets did not seem to be aware of the long time interval that would tr- transpire between the two. These prophets were given, getting words from God and just repeating them as his servants or seers or prophets. But they probably didn't have understanding that there was going to be a minimum of 2,000 years between you know, Jesus and between his first and second advent. So when you read those, you kind of, kind of keep in mind that, well, he didn't know it was going to be that long. Um, so that kind of is an overview of what the prophets are. So the first one we have here is Isaiah. And Isaiah translates in Hebrew to um, Yeshua, Yahushua, yeah. Yeshaya, I guess. It's a compound meaning of Jehovah saves. In the book, he uses a phrase, he shall save in salvation often. So his name is like Jesus saves in, in Hebrew. He was most likely born around 760 B.C. at the time of King Uzziah. And I'm going to click back to that. Whoop. Chart 45. When we look at his life, Isaiah was right here. If you notice, he, started, he was a prophet for 50 years. For 50 years, he was warning people. He started out back here at Uzziah. So Uzziah and uh, Jotham were both good kings. He was a prophet during the time of Ahaz, the bad king, and then during Hezekiah. If we look at chart 80 on page 327. This is just another chart that kind of shows when he was prophesying. 
Notice Micah and Hosea are also prophesying at the same time. But if you in the but Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. Isaiah and Micah were prophets to the southern kingdom. And then up here it gives what kings of Syria were in place at the time. So this just kind of shows that even he was one of three that were prophesying at, at the same period of time. So he started during the last 17 years of the northern kingdom, but his message was primarily to the southern kingdom. So in the time frame when he started as a prophet, the northern kingdom was still there for about 17 years, and they went into captivity. So Isaiah is talking to the southern kingdoms, and he's saying, hey, if we don't repent, God's going to let another nation come in and take us to captivity. Well, for 16 years, 11 months, and 29 days, they probably didn't believe him. But the people would have seen the northern kingdoms being overthrown by Assyria and going into captivity. So now all of a sudden the message of Isaiah makes a whole lot, has a lot more weight to it, right? If he's been telling us, say, hey, if we don't turn back, we're going to go into captivity. And as an example, watch what happens to your northern brothers. So this happens during this, this time. So it seems like he would have been very, after that 17 years, that he would have been very well received, but he really wasn't. It's even when you have something like that, they don't repent. So later, like when, oh, the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, and Lazarus, or the rich man says, you know, go back and tell my brothers. And he says, they didn't believe the prophets, they won't believe me. And if you think about that, this is kind of a good example of that. Because here was a prophet telling them we were going to go into captivity, an example happens just right across the border of it happening, yet they still don't believe. So they've gotten so stiff-necked and so stubborn that you still don't believe it. And do we see that in people today? Yeah, I mean, even if Jesus came back and raptured everyone out of here, they still wouldn't believe it's Jesus. So history keeps repeating itself. Okay, Isaiah was bold, fearless, absolutely sincere, yet stern and uncompromising. He also had a tender heart. He saw men and things from God's point of view in the light of eternity. God's point of view, that's often a lot different than our point of view, right? We always can remember that when we look at other people. You know, we look at them through our eyes or through God's eyes. You know, it's real easy to be very judgmental as humans, but then if you look at someone through God's eyes, it's, yeah, it's someone created in God's image. So, so he looked at, I thought that was interesting, he said he looked at men through God's point of view. Puts a whole new different, different perspective on thing, things. His ministry was enhanced by being gifted as a poet, a statesman, and an orator. We are told he was a son of Amos, not Amos. What was Amos famous for? Chocolate chip cookies. Right? Okay. Among other things. So from Jewish history, it's thought that Isaiah was of royal descent and a brother of King um, Emmaus, so uh, a cousin of King Uzziah. So if we flip back here, if he was from a royal family, then they're thinking that he may have been um, a brother to this king, and that would have made him a cousin to Uzziah. So Isaiah would have been from what tribe? The kingly tribe would have been Judah. So he would have been of the tribe of Judah, which makes sense if he was in the, of the southern tribes, and he was of royal descent. He was married and his wife was a prophetess. We see that in Isaiah 8.3. We don't see a lot of information about his wife, but that she was a prophetess. And we see several places in the Bible where it's mentioned that a prophet could be a, a man or a woman. It wasn't necessarily just always a man. Um, who else is, who was it in the New Testament had three daughters that were all prophet, prophetesses? Who was it that got translated? and met with the, uh, um, the eunuch of Candace. But the prophet met with her. It said that his three sisters were 
or his three daughters were prophetesses. So we see several places in the Bible that they, you know, that where it mentions prophetesses. So he had two sons. Um, the first son was Meher Shalah Hashbaz, which is speedy as the prey, and Shir Jashab, a remnant shall return. So their names were prophetic as the future of the nation. So Isaiah is married. He has a wife who is a prophetess. He has two sons. He names them these names that prophesy about, you know, speedy as the prey and a remnant shall return. So he's given them names that are prophetic about what's going to happen. Isaiah is a series of discourses delivered at different times and occasions. They're chronological in nature. So Isaiah is written chronologically. Not all of the prophets, some, some of them are going to be topical, but Isaiah is chronological. The discourses follow a similar, a similar outline. On chart 81, page 334, and I'll go ahead and flip here. This is kind of our outline of the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is kind of broken into two parts. From chapters 1 through 39 is like your first part. And then chapter 40 to 66 is kind of a second part. And we'll talk about these. There's some very interesting characteristics about this. And the, the outline is like there's an indictment or accusation. He accuses them of what they're doing. The threat, you know, the threat of what, what is going to happen to them if they don't return. Exhortation and um, entreaty and then a promise of purification or blessing. It seems like the prophets always, even though they're talking about the, there's all this bad news, you've done bad, you're going to go into captivity, but God's going to restore you. We will return. There was always a promise of restoration at the end of it for him. The book of Isaiah has four prominent songs in it. In chapter 5, there's a song of the vineyard. In chapter 12, a song of the redeemer. In chapter 35, a song of the blooming desert. And the a song of the restored wife in chapter 54. Why is a song of a restored wife important? Remember I talked about that, how God basically grants his wife Israel a divorce, and that's in Isaiah. And the only way that he can remarry a wife is if, he is a die, if the husband has died. And so it's all a picture of Jesus coming and dying. He could not have restored Israel to him as his bride unless he died. And so God came in the form of his son to die. And that way he doesn't break the Old Testament laws about uh, remarrying. In chapters 1 to 39, so this first half section, these are judgments of God. The second part, 40 to 66, are comfort of God. So the, the whole mood of, this, of his prophecies change. The first 39 is about judgment, and the second, second half, or the second part of it, is all about restoration. And the second half is where we see all of these prophes prophecies about the coming Messiah. So in the first division, we see prominent judgment of Judah and Jerusalem for their sins as well as judgment on the nations which are hostile to the chosen people. Also in this division are the promises for Judah and hope for both Jews and Gentiles in the predictions of the Messiah, the coming Redeemer, of whom Isaiah speaks so fully in the last chapters. So we get the first kind of glimpses here that there's hope for Jews and Gentile people. So start, we start seeing the Gentiles are being brought into this. In chapters 1 through 12, right here, this first section, Judah prophecies, these are discourses addressed to Judah and Jerusalem. So what is happening here is he's telling, you know, going after Judah for, for their sin and, you know, exposing their sins. In 13 to 27, he's taught foreign prophecies, these are prophecies regarding the nations which were hostile to Judah. So Isaiah is not only telling Judah, said, you know, you're doing bad, you've got to return to God, but then he also starts talking about the, the surrounding nations that have been so hostile to, to Judah. Remember he had uh, like Moabites, Amorites, 
the Hittites, you know, all the surrounding ones. Well, he starts calling them out individually, prophesying about you know, their, their ultimate destruction. So that's in this section from 13 to 27. 28 to 35 is warnings and promises. Start, kind of starts talking about you know, promises of being restored. And then 36 to 39 is a historic review of the reign of King Hezekiah. So in this, from 36 to 39, it talks about Hezekiah. And I'm just going to click back to chart 45 for a second. Hezekiah right here was the good king. Remember, he went back in and restored worship. He went in and had a campaign to tear down the temples of Baal and the Asherah poles. And I never really thought that was very significant until I started looking at things like this. To go in and destroy worship centers or of Baal It wasn't like, well, a couple of you guys take a sledgehammer and go knock that thing down. This, if we look at what entailed, I mean, just to go in and destroy that, that's a major campaign. That would be a major campaign for bulldozers and backhoes, right? So in this campaign to destroy all this, it was very, very significant. So we, I always kind of envisioned it being just something they went over and pushed over or burned down real quick. But it was major campaigns to, to clear all this out. So Hezekiah was, I'm sorry. Um, so King Hezekiah was, was doing that. Now, after that, Manasseh, I mean, he ended up being one of the worst kings of the time. So that was what is happening here in this section of 36 to 39. Now then, between 39 and 40, there's a change. And in the second half of Isaiah, what we see is it starts coming into a comfort. And let me read that. So in 39, he's talking about it's been all this destruction, everything that's going on. Uh, one of the things that happened was that um, Hezekiah had actually had the Babylonians had come to visit, and Hezekiah had led them into the temple and shown them everything in the temple and shown them all the gold, all the silver, all of the, these great, wonderful things they had. And Isaiah went to him and says, what have you done? And said, you know, because you have done this, they will come against us. And he says, so Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There's nothing in my treasures I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the, uh, of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend um, who will descend from you, whom you will be God, and they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So in 39, the end of this, the final warning is given to him that they're doomed. You know, because you've done this thing, you know, that the Babylonians are going to come back and take everything away. It happened 100 years later that they came and ransacked the temple and took everything away. Now, in chapter 40, the first word is comfort. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to hear that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So chapter 40 starts a whole new message. We go from gloom and doom to restoration and comfort. What is the last word in the Old Testament? Cursed. The last word of Malachi is cursed. What is the first word in the New Testament that Jesus said to his disciples who would follow him? 
blessed. So it's almost like in the Old Testament, under the law, we're cursed. In the New Testament, as disciples under Christ, you know, chapter 6, and when they went up, when the Sermon on the Mount, when his followers follow him up there, those who had, they'd received him as their Savior and now wanted to learn from him, the first word he says to them is blessed. Between chapter 39 and 40, here, it goes from a cursing to a blessing, right? How many books are in the Old Testament? Thirty-nine. This is in chapter 39. In Isaiah, the second half goes from 40 to 66. How many is that? 27. Isaiah has 66 books in it, 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. Isaiah, the, the gloom and doom is 1 through 39. In the Old Testament, we have chapters 1 through 39, or book 1 through 39. Of our 66 books, our New Testament is 40 to 66. And Isaiah, the, the good stuff, is 40 to 66. So Isaiah is like a little picture of our 66 books of the Bible. And we see, just as our Old Testament, the last word is cursed, the first word that Jesus says to disciples is blessed, we see here that kind of the last thing that Isaiah says to Hezekiah is, wow, you're cursed because of this. And the first word we have in 40 is comfort or blessed. So a pretty neat parallel there, isn't it? Okay, so this is the remarkable similarities, the 66 books. First division of Isaiah is 39, the Old Testament is 39. Second division is 27 chapters, New Testament is 27 books. The first division of Isaiah speaks of judgment, the second of comfort. So the Old Testament speaks of law, and the New Testament speaks of grace. Our prominent subjects in here, the first one is Isaiah's call. And Isaiah was called at a very early age, and we saw that in chapter 6. The first books of Isaiah is about a vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reign of Uzziah. So Isaiah gets to see a vision, almost like a vision of heaven. How many people got to see a vision of heaven in the Bible? Yeah, we have Isaiah. John saw it in Revelation, sure. One other one. Paul. Remember, Paul makes a statement, whether in the body or out, I'm not sure, but there was a man 12 years ago. Yeah. And if you look at Paul, what he's talking about is when he goes to, was it Lystra or Iconium, and they stone him and drag his body out, and his disciples are around him and pray for him. He gets back up and goes back into town. They think that at that time he had probably, he was probably talking about himself when he talks about this vision. But he had probably died and probably seen heaven and, and came back is what most, most think. But he says, you know, things I saw or, you know, no man is too great for any man to, to speak. And he doesn't really say, he kind of third persons himself. He says there was a man 12 years ago, I'm not sure, in the, in the spirit or out of the spirit. So we only had three instances in the Bible of someone seeing heaven. And this was, was Stephen. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Because he's, he saw, yeah, yeah. The neat thing about Stephen is he was being stoned, and he saw the gates or the doors of heaven open, and he says, I saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And you think, okay, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. But in that case, we saw, he said he was standing. It's almost like he was receiving him with a standing ovation. That'd be a neat thing to get, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, so, so his call. While he's seeing this in chapter 6, he says, um, he sees this vision, he says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I have lived among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, 
and your sins atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said to him, Here I am, send me. So this is his calling. When we see prophets on YouTube, do you think they had the same thing happen to them? Probably not. So, so this is the start of it in Isaiah 6. And Isaiah has a lot of pictures of the coming Messiah. One thing I've got highlighted here in 7. He says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be a child and give birth to a son. He will call him Emmanuel. So even early in Isaiah, he's, he's prophesying about, about the time of, of the coming Messiah. Um, warnings and comfort. Isaiah preached a twofold message, warning of judgment for sin and comfort for salvation and righteousness, kind of like the first 39 chapters and the last 27 chapters. Messianic prophecies. The book of Isaiah is known for messianic prophecies such as chapter 53. There are more messianic prophecies in Isaiah than any other prophetic book. So if people want proof, remember how like when Jesus was born, didn't that fulfill like 2,000 different prophecies? Something like that. Well, a lot of them are, are here in Isaiah, of ones of his, his birth. Um, prophetic perspective. Isaiah was given divine revelation concerning four prophetic points. The prophet's own time. You know, he was talking to his people and say, hey, we've got to turn back to God, or we're going to go in captivity just like the northern ten tribes just did. The coming captivity. Isaiah for foresaw Judah being taken captive by the Babylonians. That happened 100 years later, and so it was a 100-year time period before that happened. Uh, the coming of Christ, these prophecies abound in chapters 40 to 66. So over here, once we cross over that point between Hezek, the last story about Hezekiah and then being cursed because of it, from 40 to 66 is all about... Um, Redemption, redemption promised, redemption provided, and redemption realized. So that's this, uh, this last 27 books. The new heaven and new earth. So in this, Isaiah foresaw the end time, especially with reference to the, the millennium with Christ and the Prince of Peace, one on the most distant horizon. Isaiah sees the new heaven and the new earth in 65:17. When is the new heaven and new earth? That's after the millennial reign. So not only has he seen a time a hundred years before they go into captivity, which was roughly 586 years B.C. So he's 700 years before Christ, but he's seen at least 2,000 years after that, plus a thousand-year millennial kingdom. So he's seen something that's taking place almost 4,000 years in the future. So when he's prophesying, he's prophesying about what's happening right now, what's going to happen to us in 100 years, what's going to happen when we restore, when we're able to return, which is 170 years, when they return, return to Babel, uh, rebuild the temple. Then what's going to happen 400 years after that with the Messiah? What's going to happen 2,000 years after that for the second return of the Messiah, the second advent, and 1,000 years after that? So he's seen all these time periods in this. So when we look at Isaiah, I mean, it's incredible what he was looking at, what he was seeing, and what he was talking about. And so as, as you read this, you have to keep that in mind that he might be referring to any one of these points or any several or all of them. So this right here, this chart 81, shows that. So we're talking about God's government and God's grace. The first part is all about prophecies against Judah, prophecies against surrounding nations that are coming against them, uh, warnings, a section about Hezekiah, and then 40 to 66 is kind of, that's everything that applies to the end time of the second Messiah. A lot of our prophecies about you know, who he was, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, uh, coming back to reign, the new heaven and new earth in 65. Um, 
at 17 and 65 as behold I will create a new heaven and new earth former things will not be remembered nor will they come to mind but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and speak with a joy I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people the sounds of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought of as a mere youth. He who falls to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. So this is the time of the millennial kingdom. Uh, my chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune. And their sin, um, they will be blessed and their sentence with them. So in this, he's talking about in the millennial kingdom. Uh, Isaiah 65, right here. Yeah, Isaiah 65. And then also returning to worship God. It said, As a new heaven and a new earth I will make and endure before me, declares the Lord, so that your name and your descendants will endure from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord, and they will go out and look upon the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. So this prophecy is not only you know, it's multi-parts, but Isaiah is 66 books. It relates to the 66, or 66 chapters. It relates to 66 books of the Bible, in 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. He covers prophecies of them at the time, and then the last half of it is all about the future and coming Messiah. So Isaiah is just full of pictures of the coming Christ, who he'll be, the reign, the kingdoms, and the return, uh, his second return, his second advent. So, any questions about Isaiah? What's that? <laughs> really? Neat. Okay. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, let's take a break for 10 minutes and come back and do some more.
Oh, good, we're back. I love microphones. As long as they're on somebody else. <laughs> you have to be careful with that, though. You have to remember when to shut it off. Okay, the next of our prophets is Jeremiah. He's in here somewhere. There he is. Jeremiah is about a book of judgment. What I'd like to do first is go back again to chart 45. I just put like a leave one finger there through the whole class. Jeremiah was right here at the time of Josiah, Jeconiah, Zedekiah. And then see this little guy here? Jehoshim. He was just about three months. But Jeremiah is right here. And notice that his time frame is there's 10, 20, 30, 40, about 48 years or something that he prophesies here. And it's at the time that they go into captivity. The end of this line right here is 586 B.C. That was when they went into captivity to Babylon. So he is a prophet that sees it all take place. Isaiah was telling them, you know, Isaiah was back here 100 years earlier. Isaiah was saying, we need to turn back to God. Jeremiah's message was, too late. We're going into captivity. Take it or like, leave it. The best thing you can do is just, yeah, don't fight it. Go into captivity, and 70 years will be back. So Jeremiah wrote, was prophesying at this point. He did the book of Jeremiah and then the book of Lamentations. Lamentations means to lament, right? It's kind of from the word dirge, like a, a, which was a funeral song. Um, so Lamentations was also written by Jeremiah. So it was written at the time right in here when they went into captivity. And so Lamentations was, it's kind of like he was sitting on the hill watching the city burn, and it was like his like last poems that he wrote about, about the, um, going, being taken over and going into captivity. So this is the time frame of him. So it's, at, it's too late for him to turn back, so his message is not repent and turn back to God. It's like we're going into captivity, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's coming for us. There's nothing we can do other than just know it's God's judgment, but we are going to be restored after it. So he was called to be a prophet about 60 years after Isaiah. Notice there's a time period in here that nothing is said. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, about 60 years for Jeremiah. So from him up to like Nahum, about 45 years, 50 years. So there's this t time period in here that it's pretty quiet. Nothing is being said. It's like... God had said all he was going to say and given all the warnings he was going to warn him. And time was up. So it's the eve of the national disaster, disaster of Judah. Jeremiah's name means Jehovah throws. He was called at the darkest time in, Ju in Judah's history. He was referred to as a weeping prophet. This is a time of sorrow for Judah. Because of its sins, the fearful destruction was about to unfold. The city of Jerusalem and the temple would be totally destroyed. Supremacy would be given to the Gentiles. So this is kind of the, the end of you know, the reign of, 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 of Judah as being God's chosen people. Well, they're still God's chosen people, but now he's gonna, the time of the Gentiles starts at about this time. In contrast to Isaiah being the bold and fearless type, Jeremiah was gentle and compassionate. He ministered just before and during the final catastrophe. Through Isaiah, God said all he could say. For 60 years, he's been virtually silence. Notice chapter 45, the absence of a prophet uh, during the time of Manasseh. During the reign of King Manasseh, numberless heathen abominations began to flourish in the land. Manasseh's greatest sin was to desecrate the court of the temple by building altars to Baal and set up graven images in the holy house where God had set his throne. It's thought that he actually set up a uh, idol of um, Istar, 
in the in the throne. I mean, in the in the temple. I'm gonna win. You get what you think. I'm talking to my microphone. Um, Jeremiah five thirty one sums it up. And he said, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. That doesn't sound like today at all, does it? What are the religions that just thrive now? Prosperity doctrine, right? The name it and claim it, blab it and grab it doctrine. I mean, they're the ones with, you know, 30, yeah, megachurches, 30,000 people. Do they talk about redemption, salvation, Jesus' death on the cross, living as a servant for him? Exactly. I hope they all have one of these microphones. (laughs) I'm sorry, the thing is just horrible. Okay, so in in Jeremiah's time, both Egypt and Syria, Syria threatened Judah. They were continually tempted to make alliances with one or other for protection. Jeremiah's message was to get right with God and trust him for protection. What is going on here is that during this time of Josiah, Egypt was a major power and Babylon was a major power. And what they were doing, rather than relying on God, being independent, relying on God for their protection... They would make deals with one or the other. For a while, they would be, they would make a deal with Nebuchadnezzar and say, you know, we'll pay you taxes and gratuities, and you protect us. And then they'd go to Egypt and say, well, yeah, you protect us, and we'll pay homage to you. And then they went back to Babylon to do again. And so what happens in here is during this fall, it starts at 609 B.C., they are actually under rule of Egypt, I may have this wrong, and then Babylon comes against Egypt, so now they say, oh, well, we'll pay tribute to you now, and then they go back to Egypt. And so what they're doing is they're relying on others for protection. You know, they're not relying on God. You know, God would have, if they had stayed in God's will, God would have offered them protection, but they're going to all these different nations for protection. So in this, what happens is Jehoiakim, and I may have the story wrong, but he ends up making a deal with Nebuchadnezzar and then breaks it. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes against Jerusalem at the time of Jehoiakim. He, he is killed in battle. At this time, Daniel and his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, end up being taken captive and taken away. Then Nebuchadnezzar puts this Zedekiah as a kind of token um, king into power. And he's there for a while, and he ends up turning against Babylon also. And so the Nebuchadnezzar comes against Babylon really hard, and this is when the final destruction. They besiege Jerusalem for 18 months. Basically, they surround it, and they don't let anyone in or out. And everyone inside over 18 months ends up pretty much just starving to death. And then they finally knock down the walls and completely destroy the temple. So what is going on here is that um, Jeremiah is telling them, you know, rely on the strength of God, but they won't. They rely on the strength of other nations. They get taken into captivity. And this happens right here. Zedekiah was the one who is taken out and he's allowed all his sons and daughters are killed and then they poke his eyes out so the last thing he sees is that and he's taken into Babylon into captivity so it's a pretty gruesome time of what happens in this time period but they're not relying on God so this is where that Egypt and Syria were threatening Judah and they're making alliances with them in 612 B.C., the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. So the Babylonians not only uh, defeated the Assyrians in 612, but also defeated Egyptians in 605. On chart 82, it 
this kind of shows what's going on here. Jeremiah, you see we had um, Josiah, uh, Jeconiah, and Zedekiah. And these two here just reigned for three months. These are the last ones during Jeremiah that reigned. Something interesting happened in Jehoiakim, and we'll talk about him in a second here. Um, in fact, I'll talk about it now. Jeremiah had written his book, the book of Jeremiah. He was told to put everything together for it, and he had a, a scribe named Baruch who would write everything for him, and he had, it was prophesied against the, this tribe of Judah that, you know, about what they had done, and it was the book of Jeremiah. Well, it was read before... Jehokam, and he was sitting in front of his fireplace, it was in winter, and so he took this book and threw it in the fireplace and burned it up. And God, let me see if I can find it here. After he did that, he was cursed. And I can't find that right now, just kind of in paraphrasing. Because he had burned up this scroll of Jeremiah, God told him that none of your sons will ever sit on the throne of King David again. So that happened at his time. Zedekiah was actually an uncle who had been put in by King Nebuchadnezzar. So Jehoiakim was the one who had the curse that his son would never sit on the throne. But God had said that a descendant of King David would sit on the throne, right? And so this throws a monkey wrench into gears. Because now he's got this curse on him that your son will never sit on the throne. When we look at the two lineages, remember David had Solomon and Nathan as his sons. Solomon was the kingly line. Solomon was this line of these kings. Jehoiakim was in that line, but his descendants could never sit on the throne. That line goes all the way down to, we see that in Matthew. Remember, there's a Matthew and Luke, there's a genealogy. That line, lineage goes all the way down to Joseph, husband of Mary and stepfather of Jesus. So he's in this line. So Joseph could never have been king because of this curse. Jesus, if he had been the natural-born son of Joseph, could never have been king. But he was not the natural-born son of Joseph. He was the son of God and the son of Mary. Through Nathan, from David through Nathan going down, through Mary, that lineage, that gives Jesus the bloodline back to David. His kingly line through here has this hiccup at Jehoiakim and this curse that he cannot be king. As in Hebrew, as a Hebrew, he, he's not king, he can't be king because of the bloodline, but if he was adopted, he could be king. So the fact that he was not the son of Joseph, but the son of God, allows him to get by this and be the king of Israel because he can be the adopted son. So he's not a natural son of this line, but an adopted son. So that puts him in the line, but he's out of the bloodline, so he can be it. So even though we have this strange things that happens with Jehoiakim burning the scroll of Jeremiah and being cursed by God that he could not, that his descendants would not sit on the line, it perfectly fixes itself in Matthew, in the book of Matthew. So it's kind of an, it's an amazing little nuance that happens there that's just, you know, that just had to be divinely inspired for that to all have worked out right. So we see that in this book. I kind of sidetracked there, but that was an interesting detail. So Jeremiah, by God's direction, urged Judah to get, give into Babylon so as to avoid utter destruction. Again, Jeremiah is not telling him to repent. It's too late. Yeah, you should turn from God, but they're still going to go into captivity. 
He was timid by nature, yet gives a bold message to the people. He was utterly devoted to one task, that of preaching the message of God. He was raised in a small town of Arathath, just a few miles north of Jerusalem. His father was a priest, and Jeremiah followed in his father's footsteps. What tribe would he be? Come on, we're week 11. If he's a priest, he would have been tribe of Levi, right? We've got two more weeks and we're done. So by two weeks from tonight, you should know that. So God made known to him that he had been divinely ordained to be a prophet and that his duties of priest were finished. Jeremiah spent 50 years prophesying to people of Judah. He was instructed by God not to marry or have children, but throughout his ministry, he had a companion, Baruch, who served as a secretary. Baruch played a key role in the scrolls of the prophet and went with him into exile. Remember, um, Jeremiah goes into exile also. He, um, part of Jeremiah's message to Judah was that Babylon was to be the divinely destined master for the near future, which, of course, they totally rejected. In 588 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Thirty months later, in 586, the city and its temple were destroyed. So for two and a half years... Nebuchadnezzar set up forces all the way around the city of Jerusalem so the people there could not come in or out. They could not get food. They had the well of Bethesda, which would probably give them water. But they pretty much starved to death. I mean, this is where you hear stories of them like, you know, cannibalism came into fact. I mean, they were, were dying of starvation. Then finally they broke down the walls and broke in and destroyed everything. Um... Non-biblical tradition holds that Jeremiah was stoned to death in Egypt by the very Jews he had tried to save. The book of Jeremiah was written over many years and later put in a scroll. A diagram on page 343 shows the outline of how it came together. Jeremiah is arranged topically, not chronologically. Remember, Isaiah was chronological, you know, by date. Jeremiah is by, uh, by topics. If I look at where is it? chart 84, we see here that Jeremiah is like three, kind of like three different sections, book one, book two, and then supplements. And it's by different topics, and we see him listed here, but the first one starts out as his call. And Jeremiah, in his call, it's the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you to a prophet, as a prophet to the nations. And this kind of comes in that God is outside of time thing. So somehow God knew him before he was born, chose him, appointed him before he was born, to be a prophet. So if you wonder, like, predestination, are we predestined to be who we are or what we are or what we're going to do? This would kind of tend to point that way, at least, for, at least for one person, at least for prophets. But the next thing he does is he kind of, like, rejects it. Jeremiah is very young. He says, I'll serve the Lord. I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. Who else made that statement? Moses? Yeah, yeah. I knew that's what he meant. Yeah. <laughs> so Moses said the same thing. Oh, I have bad speech. You know, just like, how do we get out of this? So if God comes to us like, you're going to do this, it's better just like go with it and not try to get out of it and talk yourself out of it. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you to say. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. You notice when we read about the prophets that God touches their mouth. Remember before the cerebrum with Isaiah had touched his lips with a coal? That had to hurt. So here God actually you know, touches his, his mouth. So today I will point you over nations, or root, uproot, and tear down, destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Sounds kind of like Ecclesiastes, doesn't it? So that's kind of how he gets his divine, his, his start. 
So he was, his call was unique. It was prenatal. He thought his youth and experience would hinder him. He was not excused. God assumed, assured him divine guardianship. He received the personal touch of God in his divine message. Jeremiah, Jeremiah's main task was to speak for God. God would bring down judgment upon the people of Judah for their sin. God would spare a remnant. God did not search, God did not search for such a man. He was on hand, predetermined by design, serving amongst the priests. There's a twofold message here. Remember Isaiah was kind of twofold? It was about destruction, but then about uh, a future hope. Jeremiah is the same. It uh, speaks of both destruction and construction of the remnant who would return. How many returned? Let me say that in Nehemiah and Ezra. About 46,000 or something. It's only like maybe 50,000 total that returned. when there were probably millions taken into captivity. Okay, in chart 83, page 346. Here's kind of Jeremiah's message. We had a destruction and a construction. So the four themes of these were rebuke, a warning, an invitation, and a consolation with the emphasis on people's sin. So they were rebuked for their sin in the present condition. They had a warning about God's righteousness in a for a future prediction. They had an invitation to God's grace as a present offer and a a consolation for people's hope for a future prediction. So in this, he's looking at present and future in destruction and present and future in construction. So the destruction was going to happen right then, right? Within 10 or 20 years that he started his ministry, they went into captivity. The construction would have been 70 years later, so he's also given insight into this. Jeremiah contains much that is autobiographical and confessional and contains many passages of Jeremiah's confession of sin. What does that tell us about Jeremiah the prophet? That even a prophet isn't without sin, right? So I have hope. And if any of you have sin, you have hope too. So the many symbols in the book of Jeremiah, they involve actual experiences of Jeremiah where God was teaching him, and thus Judah some vital spiritual truths. These symbols, there's five of them. The first one is a linen girdle. That's basically a belt. And what God tells him to do, he says, take a like a brand new linen belt. And this would have been something that a priest might have worn on his outer garment, and it was beautiful and very clean, and it represented purity and you know, just a, a gorgeous you know, piece of clothing that they would wear around their belt. And he says, wear it around your belt. He says, now I want you to take it off, and I want you to go towards the Euphrates River. I think it's Euphrates. And I want you to stick it in a rock, you know, hide it under a rock and then go back. Well, then months later or some period of time later, God says, okay, now go get it. And so he goes and gets this sash or belt that was just this beautiful representation of his office and his priesthood and all that, and it's just trashed. And so he puts it on, and it's, it's representative. God's showing, and he wears that in front of the people, and God is showing that. It's like, here is my people. They were once beautiful. They were once, you know, had all this glory and honor. But now they've, what they've done to themselves is like what has happened to this sash or this belt that he's wearing. It's interesting that he has Jeremiah take it that direction, because that's the direction they're taking into captivity. So that was the story about, about the sash. So in this, God uses a lot of like pictures to show what's going on. The next one is potter and the clay. He tells Jeremiah, says, go to the potter's house and watch him work. And what Jeremiah does, he goes in and the potter has made this clay vessel. And then he, like, smashes it and then remakes it again. And it's kind of like a, a message that, you know, God had formed Israel or Judah into his people and was forming him into people. But now he's going to smash it back down and then remake it again. And so it's a picture that even though they will be smashed, you know, smashed back down in just a lump of clay, that he would reform them again in the future. I also find it so interesting that he talks about 
a clay vessel. If we think about it, you know, if you think about clay, you can form clay into any shape, right? You can form it into like a giraffe or a gum, gumby or a bear or something. But he forms it into a, you know, he forms it into a vessel. And the vessels, you know, he says, you know, some vessels are for great service, some for other services. But he forms the clay into a vessel. And we think of a vessel. A vessel is something empty that you pour something into. And so it's like us. I mean, we're formed into this vessel. And he has to form us and shape us into a vessel. But then what do you have to do with a clay vessel once you form it? You have to fire it. You have to put it through the fire. So it's like he forms, he forms us and shapes us in this vessel. And then he puts us through the fire. The fire is what makes the vessel, you know, the, what do they call it, a kiln? He puts it through a kiln. And it's, a, it's kind of a picture of us being put through the fire. And I think that's where the baptism of fire thing comes from. It's like he puts us through all these trials, and his trial is to solidify us into exactly what he has shaped us as. Then he can fill it. So is that a picture we, we go through? Yeah. So it's neat that he had him. Yeah, it's very smashed down. It's like I was a giraffe and smashed down, and then it was a gummy bear and smashed down. Yeah. So it's kind of like this whole picture of clay and what you can do with it. So he uses this symbology. And he shows, he's showing Jeremiah in these pictures of what he's going to do to his people. So even though they were formed as a vessel, they had to be smashed down. They hadn't been through the fire yet. He reformed them, and they're, I guess, going into captivity was going through the fire, right? So that's the second one. The third one is a shattered vessel. And in this one, he has him take like a small vessel and then sh shatter it. And I had a really good analogy, and I forgot it. Sorry. The next one is a celibacy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is told not to marry and not to have children. And this would have been very disgraceful for someone living at that time, for a young man at that time, not to marry and have kids. But he's showing that kind of as like his dis dis um, you know, disgrace, almost like you know, not having a wife and children. Maybe that's an image of what God, God felt. Then the fifth one is this filled and anathoth. Jeremiah ends up being in prison towards the end of the book. And a cousin or an uncle comes to him and says, hey, I want to sell you a piece of property. Would you like to buy it? And God says, buy the piece of property. What's crazy about this is they're just getting ready to go into captivity. A you know, the, uh, Babylon is going to come take all their land and everything they own. Why would I want to buy a piece of property now for it to be taken away? But God has him buy that piece of property. And he takes, and it's like a picture of, I've bought this piece of property. I have the title deed to it, meaning it's mine. In the future, I will return to it. He also takes that title deed and says, I think Barak helps him write it up and takes the title deed, and he puts it into a jar and seals it. And he says he puts it in a jar to seal it because it will be, be there for a long time. So he takes this title deed, puts it in a jar, and seals it that he's bought the land so that at a time in the future they can open it up and say, wow, he, you know, Jeremiah does own this land that was bought in 588 B.C. or whatever. It's kind of similar to what happened with the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, they were all put in these jars, these clay jars, and were there for, you know, 2,000 years before we found them in 1948, right? And the book of Isaiah is there, and, yeah, the Old Testament's there, you know, most Old Testament books. So it's kind of a picture of everybody's laughing at him for buying this property. It seemed real foolish, but it's like God's going to restore it. Wouldn't it be interesting if that clay vessel was found today with all that's going on about who owns um, Jerusalem? And you've got a, a title deed from 580-something B.C. by a Jewish priest, tribal Levi. It kind of makes it hard for Muslims to say they were there first. So when I read that about the, you know, I was thinking about that, about him sealing it, I wonder if that's ever been found and open. Anybody know? Anybody find it? It wasn't in my backyard. Okay, the next one is the end times. Jeremiah speaks the return from captivity and restoration of Judah at the end of 70 years. Yet it contains scriptures of both Israel and Judah being gathered, not only from Babylon, but from all nations of earth. 
So Jeremiah, kind of towards the end, starts talking about them all going back. And I can't find it right now, but it's, remember the ten northern tribes went into captivity in Assyria, and they never returned. They're called the lost tribes of Israel. But here he's saying that yet it contains scriptures of both Israel and Judah being gathered not only from Babylon, but from all nations of the earth. When will that take place? Probably kind of since 1948, right? So that was 2,600 years, years later. Okay, so that's the book of Jeremiah. It's his telling the people that we're going into captivity, we're going to be there for 70 years, a remnant is going to return. So it's a message of gloom and doom. You know, don't fight against Nebuchadnezzar. It's worthless. You know, just go willingly. You'll be there 70 years. We'll have a chance to return and, and restore. The next book is Lamentations. Lamentations is kind of just a continuation of... Jeremiah. He's been prophesying this for, what, 30, 40 years or something? Let's see, he did 10, 20, 30. Yeah, almost probably about 40 years that he's prophesying that they're going, going in. Then the last 10 years it's happened. So now Jeremiah may be 50, 60 years old or something. They've been taken captivity, they're taken captive. They were besieged by Nebuchadnezzar for 30 months. Nebuchadnezzar finally broke the walls down, went in and totally destroyed the temple. Remember, no rock will be in, I mean, totally destroyed the first temple, the Temple of Solomon. Um, anyone who was left was either killed or taken into captivity. All of the gold artifacts were taken. Everything from the temple was taken or destroyed. Remember Cyrus, when he made the decree that they could go back 70 years later, he also sent back all of the articles from the temple. So they were returned, so they went back to the temple. So he got his stuff back. How many of you have been robbed and got your stuff back? Only if you're God, right? Okay, Lamentations. So this was him watching all this happen, watching the city burn, watching the people being taken into exile, people being killed. So Jeremiah looked forward to the imminent destruction of Jerusalem and the temple as well as people being taken captive. Lamentations look back at, back at just what happened. Jeremiah is considered to be the author of Lamentations. The book was written as he watched the people in the city being destroyed. Lamentations in Hebrew is Kanoth is written as a poetic melancholy poem or dirge. So this is, you know, dirge is like a, a song at a funeral, like a death song or a song of mourning. So Lamentations is a dirge. It's read on the ninth day of Av, the anniversary of the destruction of Jerusalem of the temple. The ninth day of Av, that's the ninth day of the fourth month on the Hebrew calendar. Bad things always happen to the Jewish people on the ninth of Ab. The first temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed. If you research that, there's just like several pages of stuff that happens on the ninth of Ab. So it's kind of a day of mourning for them. So the first temple was destroyed in 586. The second one is 70 AD, but they were destroyed on the same day. Jeremiah is strong believed to be the author and have written the book around soon after 586. Lamentations is a series of five books. So if we look at here are the five books. The Ways of Zion, Do Mourn, The Day of His Anger, The Lord's Mercy, The Punishment of Inequity, and uh, Turn Thou Us Unto Thee. It kind of grows. We start out with grief, the cause of the grief, the hope, the repentance, and then the prayer. So it's in order of what you would feel. It's kind of like the stages you'd go through in mourning of a death or loss of someone. So Jerusalem weeps is the first part. 
Jehovah punishes, in the second part, the hope in the midst of affliction, sin, the, sin, the cause of uh, punishment, and then the plea for mercy. So remember, on, in, even though these are prophets that are prophesying doom, there's always a, a glimmer of hope. There's always something coming. So there's always, with, with a whole bunch of bad news, there's always a little bit of good news at the end of it that we're seeing here. They are in what's called an acrostic pattern. And in this form, each line represents each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So what, it'd be like a poem where the first line starts with an A, the second line starts with B, the third line starts with C. But instead it's Alif, Bet, Gamil, you know, the 22 words. So in chapters 1, 2, and 4, there are 22 verses. The difference is in chapter 3, what they have is it repeats three times. So, it, so there's 66 in the third chapter, 66 verses in the third chapter. And if you look in, like this is a, in a linear Bible, which is in Hebrew and Greek. If you look at it in Hebrew and you look at Jeremiah, you see that like the first verse starts with an A, the second verse starts with or a leaf, and then bet, and a gamil. So it's written as a, in a poem-type setting. Did you guys ever have to write a poem in school that started with A, B, C? Wow, that's miserable. What starts with Z besides zebra? So he did a whole lot better in third grade than I did. Okay, so that's Lamentations is written like that. Chapters 1, 2, and 4 begin with the with a word whose first letter is successively one of the 22 letters. Chapter 3 has 66, each one successive of the alphabet having three verses allotted to it instead of one. (coughs) Excuse me. There are several thoughts as to why it was written, perhaps as an aid for memorization or a symbol of the fullness of people's grief or to confine the expression of boundless grief by by limiting device. I kind of like the first one. If, If it was... You're leaving your, your home that you've had for 800 years. You're going into captivity. You're not going to return, but maybe your children are going to return 70 years later. So if you wanted to teach this to your children so they would know the story of what happened, then if it was in that form of an acrostic, it would be easier to memorize. You know, kids can memorize that easier. So maybe he did it that way so that children would remember you kind of like, Mary had a little lamb. That, well, anyway, that's all I remember that. So the final chapter is a prayer. So these are poems. These first four are poems about the grief that happened, the cause of it, the hope in the future, and repentance in a form of this acrostic alphabet-type setup. And then at the last is a, a prayer. And that's kind of a, a prayer for restoration. So Lamentations holds threefold meaning. It's the mourning over Jerusalem's judgment for sin, and then a confession of sin, and then a ray of hope. That's kind of like us, right? We should mourn about our sin and then confess it, and then we have a ray of hope in our prayer life. So Jeremiah speaks in three tones. He speaks in the first person, I, when speaking of himself, and we, when speaking of Jewish captivities, and then they, when speaking of his his brothers. The first four chapters are dirges, but the fifth is a prayer and ends on a note of hope. So Lamentations follows a natural progression. And there again, it's almost like the progression of um, grieving after, after loss of a loved one. In chapter 1, the prophet and the people were weeping over Jerusalem's destruction. And here we see Jerusalem as the daughter of Zion, um, alone in the death of a loved one. So it's kind of a, this poem is like we see this woman who is alone and she's mourning the death of a loved one. And so that's the first chapter, the first poem. The second poem, God's judgment and the cause of grief. So this is like the fall of Jerusalem and the, um, the consequences of it. The third chapter shows hope to be found. And this is kind of like 
oh, like a picture of like a lonely man, um, and then God's justice, and then him looking at hope. Now we look at 322. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his, com- for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to, be, to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. So here's kind of a picture of a, a man alone in the second one. The first, the first one being like a, a woman alone weeping for a, a deceased lover. Then chapter 4 is sin is acknowledged in the, as the cause of divine judgment. Um, then 5 is the Jeremiah's prayer on behalf of his brethren as he pleads for God's deliverance. So here we have these poems, and the last one is this prayer. Remember, O Lord, what has happened to us. Our inheritance has been turned over to our, our allies our home to foreigners. We have become orphans and fatherless, our mother like widows. We must buy the water we drink. Our wood can only be had for price. Those who pursue us are at our hills. We are weary to find no rest. We submitted to Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. Our fathers sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment. So here is this prayer, and he ends with, um, You, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. So he has this prayer for restoration, but he ends in a really strange note that renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. So this was a prayer coming from Jeremiah. Jeremiah, God called him. God touched his lips, and yet even he was so grieved over that that he thought that God had totally rejected him. But yet in this, we always see a glimmer of hope for restoration. So this is the first three of the five major prophets. These are the ones that happened right as Judah, the southern tribes, which was Judah and Benjamin, A hundred years before they went into captivity, Isaiah. And Isaiah, the neat thing about that is it's 66 books, 39 about gloom and doom, 27 about restoration, almost like our Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Then uh, 60 years later, Jeremiah is born. Jeremiah is now at a time that it's too late to to turn away. We're going into captivity, but here's how to take it. You know, if they had not like lock themselves in, do you think as many of them would have died? You know, maybe if they would have just gone out willingly, less of them would have died. You know, definitely not starved to death. You know, we don't know. But Jeremiah has, is talking about that. And then Lamentations is him lamenting or mourning over them going into, into captivity. And this is the four poems in the prayer. And a lot of it is about, about restoration. So... We don't know. I'm just speculating. Possibly, yeah. It might have been better for them if they had, had gone out. But that thought just came to me. As Jeremiah was telling them, he said, you know, go peacefully with them. But it wasn't good if you read the, uh, his, where did I sit? I lost him. <laughs> if you read like that first perhaps when he's talking here it's like I think in chapter 3 now in chapter 2 it's like look Lord and consider whom have you treated like this should women eat their own offspring the children of they have cared for. Should priests and prophets be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? Young and old lie together in the dust of the streets. My young men and maidens have fallen by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have slaughtered them without pity. As you summon to a feast day, you are summoning against me terrors on every side. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. 
Um, so yeah, it was bad. It was real bad for him. But this ends the whole part of what was spoken of in Deuteronomy, right? So Deuteronomy was the legal contract between God and them that he made with them. He says, I mean, as long as they abided by his rules that he would you know, provide for them, take care of them, protect them, everything else. And they had just gotten away. And what they got away to was these foreign gods, always being attracted by, by foreign gods. Jeremiah is also the first time we see like turning away from God as being, or using the, the words as being a, uh, like prostituting yourself. So that was like seeking other, other gods. Jeremiah was kind of where that terminology started coming into. Or being, you know, unfaithfulness. He compared like the unfaithfulness of a, a spouse as being unfaithful to him. So we saw that in Jeremiah. So any questions on those three? Remember, there's always gloom and doom with a light of hope at the end. Randall, would you close us in prayer? Thanks.